For the past month or so, we've been going through stories in the Old Testament about two prophets, Elijah and Elisha. And we've gotten to the point where now we're just focusing on Elisha. Elijah's already gone back up into heaven. And we're going to continue this for a few more weeks. There's, there's lots of stories in the Old Testament about Elisha. And many of them are stories that we don't know very well. And so it's good for us to read them and study them. You know, we always like to review. And last time we read a chapter of the Bible that I admitted I didn't know how it ended when I started reading it. Which reminds us, it's good for all of us to keep on studying God's Word. But as we talked about it, even in that chapter that wasn't very well known at all, we made some connections about how that chapter helped us think about Jesus as our Savior. And that's what I want to start with today, is thinking about how just a couple verses in this little known story still helps us think about Jesus. So last week we were in 2 Kings chapter 3. And I just pulled out a, a couple of verses from that chapter. And if you weren't there, that's okay. We can still make the connections. First one was this. The Bible said, Elisha said to Joram, the wicked king of Israel, As surely as the Lord lives whom I serve, if I did not have respect for the presence of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, I would not pay any attention to him. To kind of chuckle. That's a pretty strong statement, right? Elisha says to this wicked king, I shouldn't pay any attention to you, but I'm only going to do it for one reason. Why was he still going to share God's word with this wicked king? Out of respect for the good king Jehoshaphat. So Elisha was saying, if there wasn't this good king here on your behalf, I wouldn't be here talking to you. But since there is this good king here, and since he's on your side, then I will still share God's word with you today. How does that make us think about Jesus? Do we deserve to have God talk to us? Do you ever think about that? That would be a pretty arrogant thing to say, you know, God should talk to me. Right? You just think... You know, should the, the President of the United States just you know call you up today and say, Hey, how are you doing? It's pretty unlikely that's going to happen, right? Uh, because we don't deserve that. People like that have way more important things to do. Does, should God spend his time worrying about us? No way. And yet he does. Why does he? Because of whom? Because of Jesus. We're sinful. We don't deserve anything from God. And yet because of Jesus... God shares His Word with us. God spends time with us all because of Jesus. You see that connection? I thought it was so clear. Elisha says to this wicked king, I wouldn't be talking to you, but because of this good person here who believes in God, I'll share God's Word with you. That's, that's true for us and Jesus. Here's another place. Last week we heard about a big miracle that God did. These armies were in the desert and they ran out of water. And God miraculously made all this water show up. And you think, that's a pretty big miracle. To make all of a sudden there be tons of water in the desert. But as it was described, this is what the Bible says. For this is what the Lord says, You will see neither wind nor rain, yet this valley will be filled with water, and you, your cattle, and other animals will drink. This is an easy thing in the eyes of the Lord. He will also deliver Moab into your hands. And we talked about this neat phrase here. This is an easy thing in the eyes of the Lord. So making all of a sudden there be tons of water in the desert. How hard was that for God? Not hard at all. It was easy. And it's almost as if God says, you know, that's too small of a thing. I've got to do more than that. So I'm not just going to give you water. I'm also going to help you to defeat your enemies. And we read another verse in the Bible that uses that same phrase. This is too easy. Does anybody remember what it was? So you're, this is really good. You're, you're going back to a sermon I preached, which is good. I like that. It's not what we talked about in Bible class, though. That was impossible, right? Nothing's impossible. That was with the camel and the needle and then with Mary and giving birth to Jesus. Last week we read a, book, a verse in the book of Isaiah 
where God the Father talks to Jesus, and God the Father says to Jesus, Jesus, it's too small a thing for you just to save the people of Israel. Instead, I'm also going to have your salvation go to the ends of the earth. Right? And he uses the same phrase. And you just think, we have this God with so much power and so much grace, you know, giving you water in the desert. That's too easy. I'll do that, but I can do so much more. Sending Jesus to save my people, the Israelites. That's too easy. I'll do that, but I'm going to do so much more. I'm going to have Jesus, his salvation, will go to the ends of the earth. Okay? The last one was something really sad that we read about. At the end of our story last time, the king of Moab, so this, this pagan king, he took his firstborn son, who was to succeed him as king, and offered him as a sacrifice on the city wall. So we heard how this king of this other nation, to try to get the favor of his God, he sacrificed his own son. And we said, that's an awful thing. But it makes us think about Jesus. How so? Think of how different our God is. This king had in mind, if my God is going to be happy with me, I have to sacrifice my son to him. How did God do the opposite? The true God. God gave up his son for us. We don't have to sacrifice our children to God because Jesus came and he sacrificed himself for us. Right? And so seeing what a difference there is. Some gods demand that you have to sacrifice your children or they'll be mad at you. And our God says, no, I love you so much. I'm going to give up my child for you so you can be forgiven and saved. Is that a cool connection? Okay, so even in the Old Testament, we still see Jesus. In fact, the whole goal of the Old Testament is to prepare us to get our minds thinking about Jesus so that when we, we see him when he comes. Any questions about that or anything we've talked about the last few weeks? We're going to move on today and talk about some more miracles that Elisha did. And the miracles Elisha does today are going to be kind of cool because they're, they're done for, for some women. And again, I was thinking about that. You, you may be here, some of the ways that people criticize the Bible today. There's lots of people who criticize the Bible. And often the worst people who criticize the Bible are Christians. There's all sorts of Christians today who don't believe that the Bible is true and pick at and criticize things in the Bible. And one of the big criticisms today is, well, the Bible is all against women. Have you heard that? The Bible is all against women, and it's just this male-dominated book, and we shouldn't be using it today. And Hopefully you realize that's not true. The Bible does teach us that God wants men to be the leaders in, in homes and in church. But to help prove that the Bible isn't all against women, I want us to start by thinking of ten women who are mentioned prominently in the Bible. You think we can do that together? So you got ten blanks there at the bottom of your first page. Take maybe two or three minutes, just on your own or with the people you're sitting by, list off ten women who are mentioned prominently in the Bible. In any way. Did you come up with 10? 
You need one more? You didn't come up with ten? Just eight? Uh, well, let's list them off together. So, we're just, the Bible's message is for men and women. And there's a lot of women who are mentioned in prominent ways in the Bible. What would be an example? Mary, Jesus' mother. She's mentioned often in the Bible and held up in high regard. Mary and Martha. And their brother Lazarus, so a different Mary. Mary and Martha. There's Mary Magdalene. A third Mary, who is often with Jesus and seems to be a, a firm believer in Him. Ruth. Ruth in the Old Testament. There's a whole book of the Bible written about Ruth. Esther. Esther. There's a whole book of the Bible written about her. Sarah. Sarah, the wife of Abraham. Lydia. Lydia. Somebody said Lydia. I'm hearing too many names all at once. I can't handle this. Deborah. Tamar. Rebecca. Leah. Leah. Rachel. There's somebody's name after that lady, isn't she? Bathsheba. Rahab. Eve. Hannah. The mother of Samuel? Anna as well. Oh yeah, Anna. Uh, in the temple with Simon. Yeah, Anna. Simeon and Anna. Wow. I think we came up with 10, didn't we? Maybe like 20? Way more than 10? Okay, just keep your ears open for this. There's this, you know, this movement today. Just that we want to criticize the Bible. One of the criticisms of what the Bible doesn't have anything to do with women. It's all about men. Just realize this. That's not true. And the Bible goes out of its way to show how God used women also to do lots of great things. And God also did great things for a lot of women too. Okay, and we're going to see that today. We're going to hear about Elisha and miracles he does for two different women. There. grace is for men and women too. And so let's open up our Bibles to 2 Kings chapter 4. And we're continuing to hear about Elisha, this prophet, and the things that God uses him to do. So we'll read 2 Kings chapter 4, verses 1 to 7. I'll give you a minute to find your spot. Okay, my Bible has the heading, The Widow's Olive Oil. Yours probably says something like that. The Widow's Oil. I'll read it. So, chapter 4, verses 1 to 7. The wife of a man from the company of the prophets cried out to Elisha, Your servant, my husband, is dead. And you know that he revered the Lord. But now his creditor is coming to take my two boys as his slaves. Elisha replied to her, How can I help you? Tell me, what do you have in your house? Your servant has nothing there at all, she said, except a small jar of olive oil. Elisha said, Go around and ask all your neighbors for empty jars. 
Don't ask for just a few. Then go inside and shut the door behind you and your sons. Pour oil into all the jars, and as each is filled, put it to one side. She left him and shut the door behind her and her sons. They brought the jars to her, and she kept pouring. When all the jars were full, she said to her son, Bring me another one. Then he replied, There is not a jar left. Then the oil stopped flowing. She went and told the man of God, and he said, Go sell the oil and pay your debts. You and your sons can live on what is left. Okay, just a show of hands. Who's heard this story from the Bible before? Okay, a few of you. I think this makes it into, we have like a children's Bible story book at home. It makes it into it sometimes. All right, the story of the widow's oil. Let's go through the questions on our page. It says, how is this widow's family an example of the theology of the cross? Ooh, now I'm bringing in things that we've talked about in the past, expecting you to know them. Right? That's a hard thing. Remember talking about this? There's two different perspectives on what our lives as Christians should be like. There's the theology of glory. What does the theology of glory say? If I believe in Jesus, life's going to be great. Right? Glory. And the more you believe, the more glorious it'll be. And the more money you give, and the more money you'll have. And, okay? This theology of glory. We said that's not the way the Bible describes being Christian. The Bible describes being a Christian as the theology of the cross. What does the theology of the cross say? If, if I believe in Jesus, I'm going to face what Jesus faced. And he faced the cross. But through Jesus' cross, I know that at the end of it, I have eternal life with Jesus in heaven. And so I have hope and peace in what Jesus has done for me, but I know that my life isn't going to be easy. I'm going to face difficulty like Jesus did. So that review. How is this widow's family an example of the theology of the cross? They're destitute. They're destitute. And let's just make a connect. Who was the widow's husband? What, what's he described as? What was he a part of? He was a member of the company of the prophets. And now we've talked a little about that phrase, that it seems like these are like prophets in training, or we might call them like seminary students today, or maybe like pastors without a lot of experience today. And so here's a, a woman who's married to someone who is in the full-time ministry. Understand that term? Someone who's a, a full-time worker for God. And what happens to him? He dies. Now, it doesn't say how old he was, but this widow has two sons, and clearly the sons aren't old enough to take care of themselves. And so here's this prophet, and he dies, and he leaves behind a widow and sons who are too little to take care of themselves. And you think, does that fit with the theology of glory? No. So if I'm going to be a pastor, I'm going to be a part of this company of the prophets, then what should happen in my life? Oh, I should have an airplane, right? Or we should have all this good stuff, and I should be healthy, and life is going to go well. And here's this man who, it seems, served very faithfully and dedicated his life to God, and he died. Okay. He certainly went to heaven, right? But he leaves behind this widow and her sons. And if you think about the woman's perspective, it probably wasn't easy for her to have her husband be part of the company of the prophets. He maybe was gone sometimes. They certainly weren't wealthy. And she's a believer in God. And then what's she left with? Dead. Not just nothing. She's left with like negative things, right? Now there's creditors. That they maxed out their credit cards. And her husband dies, and now somehow she's got to pay for it. And maybe just to drive this home, this seems like a, a family that believed in the Lord at a time when very few people believed in the Lord. And so you think, well, this family's gonna, it's going to go well for them. But the Bible tells us, no, it didn't actually go well. The man died pretty young, the wife was left with this big debt, now what? One of the commentaries I read, 
had this comment on there. It's the next quote on your, on your study sheet. It says, one commentator wrote, Here is a Christian woman who has served Christ sacrificially, and now her cancer has returned. Here is a farmer in the Mississippi Delta who confesses Christ openly, and yet his crops have failed two years running, and he's going to lose his farm. Why does he say that? What's the connection? Doesn't this happen still today? All right, so he says a Christian woman, right? Maybe we think about someone like that widow who's followed God and believed in Jesus, and her cancer goes away, and you think, all right, God took the cancer away. Now it's clear sailing, and then what happens? It comes back. And what are we to make of that? She must have done something wrong, right? No, she didn't have enough faith, right? Somehow this was God's will. And it happens, right? It happens all the time. You think of a farmer, and this year with the drought, this happens to a lot of farmers. Then you have a farmer who trusts in God, and he and his family faithfully do everything they're supposed to do, and it doesn't rain. And their crops fail. And they lose their whole harvest. And it happens two years in a row, and now they're going to lose their farm. You say, what are we supposed to make of that? They didn't believe hard enough, right? Somehow, this was God's plan for our lives. What, what is it? It's the, it's the theology of the cross. Okay, I bet every person in this room, you could think of a, an example from your own life, or maybe like 20 examples from your own life, where you believe in Jesus, you trust in God, and yet things haven't worked out. And yet really bad things have happened. Okay, and if you believe in a theology of glory, you're going to end by saying, well, then God must not love me, or I must not be good enough. And then you end up in despair. But what the Bible says, that's not how it works. Right? In this broken world, God allows difficulties to come in the lives of his people. It's the theology of the cross. Any questions about that? Comments about that? I always tell people, all the time. It's not our job to know this plan. It's just our job to keep the faith. So it's not our job to know the plan. It's our job to keep on trusting. Yep. I heard somebody say, it's not our job to know the plan. It's our job to know the planner. <laughs> and so, same thing, right? Yeah. And how? I mean, this is true all the time in our lives. Life doesn't go the way we plan. And just realize to yourself, that's, that's okay. It's how it works in this world for God's people. Yeah. Uh, Lord, Jesus got all bent for hell and went out the theology of glory. He had all his followers and all mm-hmm. on the thousands. And then, then he started to turn to his disciples and said, Man, I can double this in mm-hmm. a couple of years or so. And his followers. But then he hit him with a bomb. He says, The flesh comes from nothing. Mm-hmm. And they all went away. Good example. So Terry says, imagine if Jesus had followed the theology of glory. If he had just tried to get as many people as possible to follow him. He did. He had thousands of people following him. And then he told them the truth. He said, your flesh counts for nothing. You need to trust in me. And everybody left. Okay, so we shouldn't be surprised when we go through that same experience in our lives. But that doesn't mean that this woman was hopeless. And I see that says, despite the widow's hopeless situation, she had an amazing power. She has access to. Who does she have access to? God. She has access to God. And now we just take that for granted, right? I pray and God hears me. Duh, right? That's how it works. If you think of just what we've heard from Second Kings about the, the false religions. Did the people have this understanding that these false gods just hear me whenever I pray to them? Not at all. Remember Elijah and the prophets of Baal? They're on Mount Carmel. What were the prophets of Baal doing to try to get Baal to listen to them? Yelling and dancing around and cutting themselves. And they did not have this idea, right, that I have access to God. Here's this poor widow who has no money at all and her husband just died. And what is she able to do? She's able to pray to God. 
And who immediately responds? Elisha. So God, but through Elisha, Elisha immediately responds to her. Okay, now we just had this. Remember how we started today? We had this Elisha talking to the king of Israel. And what does Elisha say to the king of Israel? I shouldn't be talking to you. I'm only talking to you because of Jehoshaphat. But if it weren't for him, I wouldn't even be talking to you. So Elisha says, if the king of Israel, just on his own, reaches out to me, what's Elisha going to do? Ignore him. But when this poor widow reaches out to him, what does he do? He immediately answers. Okay, do you see what the Bible is teaching us? Okay, does, does God listen to those who have lots of power on earth? Or success or glory? Only if they're believers. If they're believers, he does. But that's not the deciding factor. Right? In God's eyes, this widow's plea was more powerful than the king himself crying out to him. You see that? Okay, so just look again at, I think it was verse 2. Elisha replied to her, How can I help you? Tell me what you have in your house. Your servant has nothing there at all, she said, except a small jar of olive oil. When I studied this, I read this comment that said, God often begins his work at the point of our inadequacies. Do you understand what that's saying? Some of you say, no, I don't know what he's talking about. Can someone explain that? Excellent. So when you feel like you have nothing at all, God starts with what you have. And this is how our God works, that often when we're in need, God doesn't just miraculously give us something totally different. God uses what we have, what we think is too little, and he makes it more than enough. Understand that? And so with this widow, Elijah says to the widow, what do you have? And she says, Nothing. Just a little oil. Okay, and what does God say? Well, that's more than enough. Let's use that. Okay? You see how God does this? And often we'll pray to God. What we often expect is for God to just do something totally different and new. Right? God, I really have a need in this area. We think, God, well, you've got to just completely change everything and do something great. And the way that God usually provides for us is He takes what we have and what we think isn't enough. And he makes it more than enough. That's how God works. And so all this woman had was some olive oil. And so what does God tell her to do? So go around your town and get all of the jars you can find and start filling them. And all she uses is that olive oil that she had. And what miraculously happens? It just keeps, keeps multiplying, you know? And so as you try to imagine, what must have this been like? She probably had this little jar, and she just tips it, and it starts pouring out. And it just keeps pouring out. And she fills up this really big jar, and it's still going. And it would have been this, this amazing thing. And God took what she had, and God made it be enough. But he didn't just make it be enough. He made it be more than enough. She was able to pay back her creditors and... What else was she able to do? Live on it. So God didn't just, well, all right, you need rescue from your creditors. I'll go that far, no more. But God did more than what she asked. She took that little oil, made it be enough to pay back the people she owed money to, plus have money to survive until those sons grew up old enough so that they could provide for their family. God took the nothing that she had, and she made it more than enough. And this is what God does with us, isn't it? We're going to think about this in a couple of weeks because there's a story where Elisha feeds a big crowd of people. So we'll refer to it again then. But it makes us think of Jesus feeding the 5,000. And so there's 5,000 people there who are hungry. And in our minds, we think if Jesus is going to feed them, he's just going to make like hamburgers appear, right? Like that's what I would have done. Just, all right, you're all hungry, here's some pizza. And then all of a sudden there's pizzas all over the place. But what did Jesus ask? 
The disciples come. Oh, we can't feed these people. And Jesus said, what do you have? And they said, we have five loaves of bread and two fish. It's nothing. They can't go anywhere. And Jesus said, no, that's plenty. Right? And he took that very little bit that they had, and he made it more than enough, and they feed 5,000 men plus women and children, and what was left over? Twelve big basketfuls of food. He said, this is how God works. That when we're in need, he hears us. He doesn't just all of a sudden give us a whole bunch of stuff we didn't have, but he takes what we had, and he, he makes sure that that's more than enough for what we need. There's an interesting detail in this story. Where does the woman do the pouring? In her house, and she closes the door. Why would God have her do that? Because God commands her to do that, right? Go in your house, take your two sons, just you and them, close the door. Why would God have her do it that way? That's a good point. Maybe if people saw it happening, they would have wanted part of it. It's like, oh, I, I told you I gave you all my jars, but I actually have these two big ones back at my house here. Let's fill those two yet, too. Yeah, God, I think if it was us today, we would like stream it live, right? We'd live stream the, hey, everybody, watch this. Watch what's happening. And I want, you get it, go ahead. You just didn't want it publicized or shown at that point yet. It was not ready to be. Good. Who was, who was that miracle for? It was for that one widow and her two sons. And don't we sometimes get in our heads today, well, if it's not this really big deal, it's not important. And God says, this widow is so important that I want to do this just for her. And it's not actually about everybody else seeing it and being amazed. That's not what this is about. I'm doing this for her. Because I, I love her and care for her. Isn't that cool? Maybe it's a little bit of a caution for us today. We just live in a culture where we want to just publicize everything. Right? Look at this great thing. Look at this great thing. And now we want to give glory to God and we want to tell others what God has done. But isn't it true that often when we do that, we actually are looking for glory for ourselves? And we say, hey, look at what God did for me. And it's kind of like, well, God hasn't done this for you. This makes me a little bit better than you, doesn't it? Yeah, it teaches us to be careful, even when we talk about what God has done for us, to make clear that the focus is on God. And if any part of me proclaiming this to everybody is going to bring glory to me, maybe it's better not to do it. Does this make sense? Right? God did this miracle for her. You see this in the New Testament. Jesus often will do a miracle, and then what will he tell the person that he did the miracle for? Don't tell anybody. Don't tell anybody. We just cannot understand that, right? And it blows our minds. But it's exactly what's happening here, isn't it? Why would Jesus tell them, don't go tell everybody? Who is the miracle for? That person, just take the heart what God has done for you. Don't go around and go on all the talk shows, because then it's going to be about you, right? That's Well, look at this person and all the attempts in this person's getting. That's not the goal. The goal is just appreciate the grace of God that he's shown to you. Yeah. Also, I was thinking that Jesus wanted the, the attention to be on his message, mm -hmm. not on what he could do for people, because then that's what they would want, is just... Yeah. Well, I want a miracle. Just, you know, you did that for them. I want it for me. And right. it would take away from what he was here to do. Excellent. So Jesus, one of his goals was he wanted people to focus on his words, on his message. He didn't just want to be this miracle worker. He wanted to be a preacher of law and gospel, of God's word. Is that why he told the people, I'm not your preacher? Yeah, I'm not your, your bread king, right? People, hey, let's follow Jesus. He'll give us food all the time. And Jesus, that, that's not what I came for. Sometimes I will because I care about you, but I didn't come to give you bread so you don't have to work. I came to take your sins away. Right? Excellent. So what, what's so clear about this story is this was a miracle Jesus did just for this one person. And he still did it. 
Because how much did God care about this widow? A whole bunch. I have to do all that. Okay, and some of us here are widows. Or if we're not widows, some of us feel like we're not that important. Like in the grand scheme of things, why would God pay any attention to me? And the story says, if you have nothing, if you're at the bottom of the totem pole, if nobody thinks of you and says, wow, that's a great person, you're exactly the person that God loves and that God cares for. At the bottom of the page, I have one more connection to Jesus. The widow had a debt she couldn't pay, so God paid her debt for her. How does that remind us of what Jesus has done for us? We have this debt of our sins that we could never pay. Like we couldn't even start, right? And what did Jesus do? He paid it all for us. So Jesus took our debt and he paid it for us. Just like he took that widow's debt and he paid it for her. Last questions or comments on that story? You know? The meditations this last week dwelt on that, you know, not you're not feeling it to be brought out in the public or whatever. Mm -hmm. Because it's not you. That's your faith is. Good. So again, that's it. The meditations, the devotions this last week emphasized this. Don't do not do your good things so that everybody else praises you. Because right. the focus of doing this for God, if God sees, that's the goal. To be thankful for God, to God for what He's done for us. John? God loves us so much that He takes on our robe of filthy rags and gives me Yeah, excellent point. God loves us so much, He took on our dirty rags of sin and He gave us His robe of righteousness. And that's the good news of the Bible. Let's get going. We actually have a much longer story now to read about another woman. So we're to chapter 4, verse 8. And this is a longer story. We'll read it just a couple of verses at a time. It says, One day Elisha went to Shunem, and a well-to-do woman was there who urged him to stay for a meal. So whenever he came by, he stopped there to eat. She said to her husband, I know that this man who often comes our way is a holy man of God. Let's make a small room on the roof and put in it a bed and a table, a chair and a lamp for him. Then he can stay there whenever he comes to us. Okay, so we hear about another woman. I have a mistake on our study sheet I'm noticing. It says another wonder for a widow, but that was the last story. It should say a wonder for a woman. The second woman is not a widow. She's married. It says she lives in Shunem. Some people like maps. I know you especially like maps with small letters on them that you can't read what it says. That's always the best type of map. Okay, this is Israel. Remember in Israel, you get your bearings by the Sea of Galilee and the Dead Sea. Sea of Galilee up here, the Dead Sea down here, you can see we're kind of focusing on the north because we don't see the whole Dead Sea. Here's the Jordan River. Shunem is right here. So it's kind of north. Here, Samaria is the capital of Israel. Jerusalem would be way down here. And it's just this little town up there. We don't know a lot about Shunem. It wasn't really very important for anything, but Elisha would would pass through there. I have on your study sheet a verse from the Bible, Matthew chapter 10, verse 40. How did this woman follow what Jesus later said? Anyone who welcomes you welcomes me, and anyone who welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. Yeah, and it says that clearly, right? She recognized this is a man of God. He's going around doing God's work, sharing God's message. And so she welcomed him. She cooked for him. And even made a point that we're going to make him a little room. We'll have our own little bed and breakfast for Elisha when he comes and stops here. And I think that's exactly what Jesus was talking about. That when you appreciate someone sharing God's word with you, then you show them, you welcome them, and when you welcome them, you welcome Jesus himself. Right, let's keep going. 
Starting verse 11. One day when Elisha came, he went up to the room and lay down there. He said to his servant, Gehazi, Call the Shunammite. So he called her, and she stood before him. Elisha said to him, Tell her, You have gone to all this trouble for me. Now what can be done for you? Can we speak on your behalf to the king or the commander of the army? She replied, I have a home among my own people. What can be done for her? Elisha asked. Gehazi said, She has no son and her husband is old. And Elisha said, Call her. So he called her and she stood in the doorway. About this time next year, Elisha said, You will hold a son in your arms. No, my lord, she objected. Please, man of God, don't mislead your servant. But the woman became pregnant, and the next year, about that same time, she gave birth to a son, just as Elisha had told her. So we hear that Elisha really appreciated what this woman had done, and so he, he asked her, what can be done for you? And her response is great. She basically says, you don't have to do anything for me. And of course, that's the attitude that God wants us to have when we serve God. We're not serving God so that God gives us something. We're not trying to earn something from Him. We're just doing it because of His grace. And that's what this woman was doing. She was just serving Elisha out of love for God. But Elisha insists, I'm going to do something for you. And so his servant said, well, she doesn't have any children. And her husband's old. And I bet she'd like to have a child. And so Elisha goes to her and says, well, you're going to have a child. And she says, no, don't, don't give me news that's too good to be true, right? Don't tell me this if it's not going to happen. And yet, a year later, it happened, and she had a child. Okay, this is one of many stories in the Bible that reminds us that children are a blessing from God. And I think maybe we could agree that in our world today, people don't appreciate children very much sometimes. And children are a blessing from God. We made a list on the first page of a, a bunch of different women in the Bible mentions. Let's make another list, and it might have some similarities. Name some women or some couples, husband and wife in the Bible, who struggle to have children. And I, I bet we could come up with at least a list of eight. Oh, three. Three's not enough. You got to do more than three. All right, so take another minute or two, just on your own with the people around you. See who you can come up with. Women or couples who struggled with having children in the Bible. Sarah, Abraham and Sarah, remember they prayed, they got over and over and decades went by and Sarah didn't have children. Tell how old was she when she gave birth to Isaac? 90 years old. And Abraham was 100. Right? But Sarah's barrenness, that's a huge part of the Bible's message in the story of Abraham. They had to trust that God would give them a child. Someone else mentioned Rebecca. So Sarah's son was Isaac. Isaac married Rebecca. And we're told that Rebecca's womb was closed. She couldn't have children. And so Isaac prayed and prayed, just like his father Abraham had done. Let, let us have children. And finally God opened her womb. And whom did Rebecca give birth to? Twins. Jacob and Esau. Okay, so Sarah and Rebecca. Someone else? Rachel, the very next generation. Then Jacob marries two women. That's a whole other story, right? Leah and Rachel. Leah 
is very fruitful, has a number of sons, but Rachel, who happens to be Jacob's favorite wife, again, this is it's all messed up. This is why you shouldn't have two wives. But <laughs> Rachel is his favorite wife, and she can't have children. And so Jacob prays for his wife, and finally God gives her two children, Joseph and Benjamin, and they were the favorite sons of Jacob, which was a whole other problem. If yeah, Rachel couldn't have children, who else? Elizabeth. Elizabeth, the mother of John the Baptist. So remember, there's Elizabeth and Zechariah, and they're both very old. And Zechariah is a priest, and God comes to Zechariah and says, your wife's going to give birth to a child. And it was so unbelievable, he didn't believe it, right? And that was John the Baptist. Somebody else mentioned Hannah. Hannah is the mother of Samuel. And there's really this touching story in the Bible where Hannah every year would go to the temple and pray, not the temple, there wasn't a temple, the tabernacle. She'd go to the tabernacle and pray to God. And she prayed so fervently that the priest thought she was drunk. But she wasn't. She was just praying for a child. And she gave birth to Samuel. Maybe I should just put five blanks on there. <laughs> I know there's more. Dave, do you have another one? Tamar. Tamar. Oh, yeah. So not a happy story, but there was a woman who wasn't able to have children and dressed up like a prostitute and ended up sleeping with her father-in-law, right? and became pregnant, and ended up being one of the ancestors of Jesus. I bet you Googled this, Dave. Did you Google this? No, I Googled Rahab. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you have another one, though? No, because Rahab didn't have problems with the I don't know that we hear about that with Rahab. She was also in the line of Jesus. Yeah, we have some just surprising people that show God's grace in the line of Jesus that we wouldn't expect to be there. Well, let's go with that list. Six is enough. So in the Bible, there's this constant thing that if you have children, this is a blessing from God. And we could put this, this Shunammite woman on the list, that God enabled her to have children. I have at the bottom of the list, circle the name who most closely compares with this woman. There's one that most closely compares with her, and that's Sarah, because of one phrase. What phrase in what I read is exactly the same as what Sarah hears? At this time next year, you will have a child. God said that same phrase, at this time next year, you'll have a child, to Sarah. Okay, now we're kind of combining lots of stories from the Bible, but, okay, there's this clear connection. Sarah couldn't have children. God made her this promise. This time next year, you'll have a son. It's exactly what Elisha says to this woman. This time next year you'll have a child. And she did. The Bible, I've got just another statement that stuck out to me. God delights to give you good gifts, not because you're so prominent, but simply because he's that kind of a God. Okay, think about all of the other people that we named. Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, Elizabeth, Hannah. Let's just go with those five. All of their children, whom God miraculously gave them, became very important people. You follow that? So, their children became Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, John the Baptist, and Samuel. Would be on the list of five of the most important people in the Bible. Okay, We haven't finished the story yet, but this Shunammite woman's son, how important does he become? We don't hear anything about him. He's just a guy. Right? Okay? But notice this. God doesn't just let women have children when they're going to have a really important person in the family line of Jesus. Sometimes he lets women have children because he loves them. Just because. Right? Isn't that a good reminder? And sometimes we see, we see God's miracles in the Bible and they're clearly connected to God's doing this so that Jesus can come and save the world. A lot of God's miracles are like that. But sometimes there's a miracle where 
God did this just because he's that kind of a God. And he just showed grace to this woman and her family just because he's a God of grace. That's the kind of God that we have. Let's go to the last page. The story continues in a surprising way. So we're in 2 Kings chapter 4 to verse 18, right where we left off. It says, The child grew, and one day he went out to his father, who was with the reapers. He said to his father, My head, my head. His father told the servant, Carry him to his mother. After the servant had lifted him up and carried him to his mother, the boy sat on her lap until noon, and then he died. She went up and laid him on the bed of the man of God, then shut the door and went down. So I said it's kind of surprising. You think if God gives this woman this miraculous son, what's that son's life going to be like? Miraculous, awesome, right? Everything's going to go well. He's going to be the next king or something like that. And what happens to this boy? He does. And again, we're not told how old he is, but the fact that the servant could pick him up and he sat on his mother's lap, he must have been a, a little boy, and all of a sudden he dies. Just like that. Okay, you see, this seems difficult to understand. Got the statement on our sheet. God's gifts to his people often include both the glad and the sad. And we like to think that if there's glad things and sad things in life, one of the two comes from God. Which ones come from God? The glad things, the glad things right? When things are going good, this is a blessing from God. And then, bad things happen. And how do we, we feel? What do we think? Well, this can't be from God, right? Now my life's out of control. What's going on? The Bible would have us understand something. Which come from God? The glad things or the sad things? Yes. Both of them do. Both of them do. And so God, in his wisdom, which is so much deeper than ours, sometimes he sends us glad things, and sometimes he sends us sad things, and they're both gifts from God. Can you think of other examples in which God's gifts make us need God more? Do you see what happens here? God gives this woman a son, and the woman actually ended up needing God more now that she had the son that she did before. Does that make sense? Usually you think, well, if someone gives me a gift, I'm going to have less need, right? But often the way it works with God is when he gives us good things, he uses even those good things to make us need him more. Could you think of examples of that? Let's say you, you pray to God that you, you get a, a better position at work. And you think this is going to be great, and you pray and you pray, and so you get this, this really high position with lots of responsibility at work. That's a blessing from God, right? But what happens when you get that position? What do you, what do you realize you need? You have no idea what you're doing, and you need God even more. Does that make sense? Okay? So when God gives us something good, it, it doesn't mean, well, now I need God less. It often means, well, now I need God even more. Yes, you've got one child, and then time goes on, and soon you have three children. And what do you realize? You need more help. <laughs> I, I need God more, right? I don't need God less. Each one of those children is a blessing from God. They're, they're good things. But these blessings God puts in my life, they actually make me depend on God even more. This makes sense. Same with this Shunammite woman. God, it was a blessing to have a son, but with a blessing, there's, there's both glad and sad. And even God's blessings lead us to need God even more. Here was another quote that stood out to me. It says, What can you do when God's mercy has turned to malice? Take the bitter distress, and in it keep clutching at the God you don't understand. We have a word for that. Faith. 
Just kind of what Danny was saying before, right? When things don't go right, you trust in God. And what do we call that? Trusting in God even when you can't see what's happening? We call that faith. Okay, and so God gave this woman a, a son. He was a blessing. He died. And what was God calling that woman to do? To trust in you. To have faith. Let's see how the story ends. Verse 22. She called her husband and said, Please send me one of the servants and a donkey so I can go to the man of God quickly in return. Why go one today? He asked. It's not the new moon or the Sabbath. That's all right, she said. She saddled the donkey and said to her servant, Lead on him. Don't slow down for me unless I tell you. So she set out and came to the man of God at Mount Carmel. When he saw her in the distance, the man of God said to his servant, Gehazi, Look, there's the Shunammite. Run to meet her and ask her, Are you all right? Is your husband all right? Is your child all right? Everything is all right, she said. When she reached the man of God at the mountain, she took hold of his feet. Gehazi came over to push her away, but the man of God said, Leave her alone. She is in bitter distress. But the Lord has hidden it from me and has not told me why. Did I ask you for a son, my Lord? She said, Didn't I tell you don't raise my hopes? Elisha said to Gehazi, Tuck your cloak into your belt, take my staff in your hand and run. Don't greet anyone you meet, and if anyone greets you, do not answer. Lay my staff on the boy's face. But the child's mother said, As surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So he got up and followed her. Gehazi went ahead and laid the staff on the boy's face, but there was no sound or response. So Gehazi went back to meet Elisha and told him, The boy has not awakened. When Elisha reached the house, there was the boy lying dead on his couch. He went in, shut the door on the two of them, and prayed to the Lord. Then he got on the bed and lay on the boy, mouth to mouth, eyes to eyes, hands to hands. As he stretched himself out on him, the boy's body grew warm. Elisha turned away and walked back and forth in the room, then got on the bed and stretched out on him once more. The boy sneezed seven times and opened his eyes. Elisha summoned Gehazi and said, Call the Shunammite, and he did. When she came, he said, Take your son. She came in, fell at his feet, and bowed to the ground. Then she took her son and went out. So you see in here, we, we talked about just the Bible loves to talk about women and often uses women as an example of faith in God. Where do we see this woman's faith in God in this really sad time in her life? What does she do immediately when her son dies? She goes and seeks out God. She goes and seeks out God. And I just pull my map up here. Because you like maps, you told me. <laughs> so, Shunem is right here. Mount Carmel is over here. And I think if I remember right, it's about 15 or 20 miles away. Remember, Israel is way smaller than the United States. But still, she had to ride on a donkey for 15 or 20 miles. And she says, I'm going to go there right away. Okay, and so when, when, when she loses her son, immediately she turns to God. And she goes to Elisha, and there's something kind of interesting in this story. Did Elisha know what was going on? No, sometimes God revealed a lot to his prophets, and they knew things that they couldn't have otherwise known, but sometimes he didn't. And so Elisha had no idea what was going on. And he says to a servant, something's troubling her, but I don't know what it is. Okay, and she tells him it has to do with her son. So what's Elisha's first idea? He tells his servant, take my staff and go and lay it on the, the boy. And what did Elisha expect to happen? Well, he figured this was going to work, right? Otherwise he wouldn't have told him to do it. Did it work? No. Isn't it kind of good to see this happen in the Bible sometimes too? And here's God's prophet Elisha, and he's got this idea, well, the boy's dead. I think if, I think if my servant lays my staff on him, he'll get up. And did he? No. Okay, so is Elisha the solution to life's problems? No. God is. 
Okay, one more statement on our page today. It says, evaluate, none of God's servants is as adequate as he is. Isn't that true? And, you know, sometimes God works through his servants, and it's good to have servants of God who are with us and teach God's word to us, but none of them, or none of us, are a replacement for God himself. Okay, and so as this woman was seeking out a license, she, she knew it. I'm, I'm really seeking out God. He's the one who can help me. Don't it's interesting to compare uh, Elisha's failure with Jesus' great success uh, in the New Testament when the centurion comes and says, you need not come to my house to kill my servant. You can do it right here with but a word. Good example. So we have some long-distance healings in the Bible. right? That's kind of what Elisha's trying to do. Take my staff and go, and this will heal the boy. And Jesus did that. Right? He healed people just by saying a word, and they would go home, and they would find the person well. Good connection. Right? What's interesting is we don't ever hear Jesus getting it wrong. Right? Of all the miracles he did, it never says, well, Jesus said, let's try this first. And, well, no, that didn't work. Let's try plan B. Jesus never had to turn to plan B. Okay, so Elisha, God used him to do amazing things, but he wasn't God. He had human limitations, and the woman's faith needed to be in God himself. Yeah. This has always bothered me, and I know there's probably a very good reason for it, but he asks her, is everything okay? And she says, everything is all right. Why? <laughs> so why did the woman keep saying everything is all right? I'm bothered by why she didn't tell her husband, right? <laughs> she should tell her husband. Okay, if one of your children dies... Ladies, tell your husband about it. He has a right to know that. But I think all the way through, it's, it's this woman has faith. She wasn't trying to hide it from her husband, but she was convinced maybe God can do something today that's going to completely change this. And if you notice, who, whom does she say everything is all right to? It's not Elisha. It's the servant. And so you see in this woman this this desire. I need to speak to Elisha himself. And so the servant comes, what's wrong? If she just tells the servant, he's going to go back and she doesn't want him to go back. I want to speak directly to God's representative and that's what she was able to do. Denise? This was such an urgent matter to her that she didn't want to be distracted hmm. by what the husband's reaction would be or the servant's reaction. She just this is where I've got to go. She was really focused. Excellent. She was focused. And in my time of need, I need to get as close to God as I can get. And that's Elisha. So I need to get right to Elisha. And God's going to help me through him. Dave? I have one question. I have your answer, but why does she not have a name? Why does she always have a name? Yeah, why does she not have a name? Um, so first, I can't say for certain why she doesn't have a name. But people point out that it actually makes the story better. Because it's not about who she is, right? It's not again. It's not well. If she had a name, then she would be the famous woman of who had, who had this strong faith and God raised her son. And, but it's not about her either, right? She, she's an example of this is one of God's people whom God cares about, and God gives her a son, even though the son isn't going to grow up to be anybody great. It doesn't matter. God gives her a son, and when she's in need, she goes to God, and God hears her. Not because of who she is or what her name is, but because of the grace of God. And so, sometimes when we see, like, the previous widow wasn't given a name either, right, at the beginning of the chapter, so that we can so much more easily just put ourselves in there, right? God has shown the same grace and love to me. It's not about this one person and her name. It's about God's grace to us. We almost made it today. Yeah. <laughs> really good. Okay. Mm -hmm. I gotta tell everybody this story. This mm -hmm. is unbelievable. Mm -hmm. In our town of Laverne, South Dakota, we made world news all over the world. Mm -hmm. Bishop and Triplin, uh, they had five children already, mm -hmm. and they got five at one time. And so they said, well, we ain't got a house big enough, and we ain't got no means to build a bigger house. That one. 
Brown County came along and they said, we'll build you that house. Mm -hmm. And so, in the end, they still had one more. So they had to raise 11 children. Wow. So Terry's Crown of this, was it your hometown, Aberdeen, right South there, Dakota? Right there, Aberdeen, there was South a couple Dakota. that had five children and then they had one. quintuplets? Is that what you no, said? They five. They had five already and they had five. Five more. more. This was unheard of in the world. Yeah, they had, they had, five, had five more children at once. Died with four, I guess. Right. And then they had one more. So they ended up with 11. Yeah. And God provided for them. That's a good example. I got one thing to end with. At the bottom, just another connection to Jesus. This is something I did not realize. But the city of Shunem, this little town that nobody really knows anything about, was on the side of a hill. On the other side of that hill is a little town called Nain, which again isn't very important, nobody's heard about it, except Jesus did something in Nain. Jesus raised a widow's son from the dead in Nain. And that was where Jesus was walking into the town and there was this procession coming out of a, a woman mourning for the death of her only son. And right then and there, Jesus raised him back to life. And you think the people there must have made the connection. Right? And so you've got Shunem on one side of the hill and Nain on the other. And Elisha raises one boy, Jesus raises another. And the message is loud and clear that Jesus has power even over death. And that's the message of Easter. Jesus rose from the dead. But it's also the message of the Old Testament that our God has power even over death. And what comfort that gives us. All of us face death for us and for the people we love. And Jesus' voice can call people back from the dead. We'll stop there. Thanks for coming today. Come back again next week. Next week we're actually going to talk about a well-known story from the Bible. It's Naaman and his leprosy. Which is, if people know one story about Elisha, it's that one. But we'll spend some time talking about that story next week. Let's go with a prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, today you show your love to people who we don't even know their names. There was this widow and her sons who were in need. There was another woman who lost her son and was in need. And both of them, you cared for them. You cared for them not because they were so great or important. You care for them because you're a God of grace. And that gives us confidence that you care for us. Maybe we're not that well known. Maybe sometimes we feel like we're not important at all. But we're important to you. We pray that you take the little that we have and you make it more than enough. That you bless us when times are good and when times are sad. That we recognize everything that happens in our lives is part of your plan for us. Help us to keep trusting in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.